Uh, first of all, let's uh, talk about the scope and syllabus of this course uh, title uh, Foundation of Scientific Computing. This is offered as a science selective course to our third year and final year undergraduate students. Um, no specific prerequisite is necessary for this course other than uh, exposure to courses uh, which are given to our first and second year students on calculus, ordinary differential equations and partial differential equations. Students at uh, IIT Kanpur usually take an introductory course on computing, uh, which is however not related to scientific computing, uh, the subject of this lecture series. <laughs> uh, however, I must emphasize that uh, any new material that will be taught in this course will be done so very thoroughly. Uh, and for that, uh, there is absolutely no need for any book or monograph. Now going to the details of the syllabus for this course, we will begin by talking about basics of computing and thereby we will talk about discretization of governing equations and associated numerical errors. Uh, as uh, usual, we will start with computations of ordinary differential equations and since uh, some of the students may be familiar with it, we will uh, introduce what is known as stiff differential equation. These are uh, very important class of problems uh, and they need uh, to be handled with care because this uh, <clears throat> depends on parasitic error growth and solving stiff equation uh, is performed via various routes. Uh, here we will uh, just briefly mention about orthogonalization uh, but spend a little more time on a new uh, method which has come up over the last uh, 30 years or so. It is called the compound matrix method. <clears throat> Once we are uh, through with this, we will uh, also talk about uh, uh, various uh, two time level methods of non-stiff ordinary differential equation and then we will move on to classification of uh, governing partial differential equations that one encounters in scientific computing. <clears throat> We will uh, see that these equations are classified into parabolic, elliptic and hyperbolic equation. And uh, one of the interesting aspect of scientific computing is irrespective of whatever class of equations we solve, we uh, scientific, I mean we computationally handle it as if uh, we are treating the problem as parabolic or hyperbolic equation. And in that respect, Wave mechanics is a very uh, important uh, issue uh, that uh, we should be talking about. Two types of waves that one comes across, uh, one those are governed by hyperbolic partial differential equations and the other one is called the dispersive waves which are uh, governed by anything other than hyperbolic PDs. <clears throat> and all these waves are uh, basically uh, governed by dispersion relation. Uh, that actually in a sense mean how space and time variation are, uh, is governed by this uh, equations. So this is an important concept. So we talk about wave mechanics in quite a bit of uh, details. <clears throat> Next we will move on to finite difference methods, uh, talking about discretization of spatial derivatives via polynomial expansions or by operator notations. In this regard, we will be talking about uh, explicit uh, central methods as well as uh, uh, upwind methods. Uh, once having done that, we will systematically go over uh, discussing about parabolic differential equations and in this topic itself, we will uh, introduce explicit and implicit method of solving differential equations. Uh, once this is done, we will move on to uh, elliptic uh, PDs and in this uh, methods we basically talk about the classical iterative methods which will uh, actually in a sense treat this uh, elliptic partial differential equation in a parabolic framework. So we are in that sequence coming along and we will also talk about uh, what is known as alternating direction implicit method or ADI method. Uh, this this was quite popular about uh, 40, 50 years ago. Now it has been uh, overtaken by other methods and one of the newer method 
will uh, include in this course is called the multigrid method. This is uh, a huge area of research which uh, uh, can actually cover a full course itself, but we'll just simply introduce the scientific aspect of multigrid methods. Having uh, solved the parabolic and elliptic uh, PDs, we'll uh, <clears throat> naturally move over to uh, hyperbolic uh, PDs. And while doing so, we actually introduce a spectrum theory of uh, discrete computing because many of the ideas of computing has evolved uh, while performing stability analysis of partial uh, parabolic uh, PDs, but uh, essentially the error is governed by uh, methods um, or equations which uh, propagate the error as waves. That's why we emphasize quite a bit of our time on wave mechanics. And while talking about the stability analysis, we'll specifically talk about theory of signal and error propagation. And once again, we'll talk about dispersion relation preservation property. Uh, thereby, we want to highlight that um, the space-time dependence of exact differential equation and numerical methods must be close to each other. That's what is meant by DRP property. <clears throat> now, uh, in this context, in solving um, hyperbolic PDs, we'll be talking about uh, convection equations, one-dimensional convection equations, and we'll uh, also talk about refraction or diffractions of mechanical waves. This we'll talk about with respect to uh, surface gravity waves that one sees uh, uh, in the treatment of water waves um, by linearizing and uh, uh, treating it as an inviscid uh, uh, flow property. <clears throat> Subsequently, we talk about uh, how these uh, surface gravity waves are affected by dissipation and nonlinearity. In that context, we'll be introducing uh, the students to soliton and uh, a special class of periodic waves called sinoidal waves. Uh, and having uh, done that, uh, we are uh, in a, a framework where we can uh, talk about how to design uh, high accuracy, high fertility computing methods. Uh, that would involve uh, severe control of errors. Uh, this we can pose itself as an optimization issue. And in this context, we'll talk about uh, near spectral compact difference methods and uh, which will occupy quite a bit of our uh, discussion space. <clears throat> now, while talking about the spectral analysis, we'll uh, introduce the effect of nonlinearity in computing. That brings about uh, aliasing problem and also focusing of error. Uh, we are all already maybe familiar with the uh, effect of nonlinearity in compressible flows where uh, discontinuities come about in terms of uh, shock waves and associated Gibbs phenomena. Uh, here we would like to talk about one particular topic which is, uh, which is very specific to computing. This is called the spurious uh, propagating waves which are uh, called the Q waves. This is what we will be talking about. Having uh, exhausted uh, various topics of uh, finite difference method, we'll move over to finite volume and finite element method and systematically compare these methods with finite difference methods. And uh, we'll basically keep our attention focused to propagation problems because that's what uh, is important in scientific computing. I think this will more or less uh, uh, finish all the uh, available time that we have over the semester um, and we would like to uh, basically give you some uh, information about textbook and references. Um, for this course, uh, uh, what we are uh, going to do is we are going to record the live lectures given to the students here for this course on foundation of scientific computing. It's a science elective, so it's a uh, not necessarily a compulsory course. Those who are interested, they opt for it. And uh, most of the material uh, can be uh, found in the following references. Uh, number one is a book that was written some time ago by me, but al although it's not uh, really up to date. 
Uh, good news is that all the chapters of these books are available in Google Books for free. So there is uh, uh, very little effort one has to pay in uh, downloading these materials. And also, of course, um, all the slides that uh, uh, I'm going to show it to you during the teaching should be made available to the students of this course. I would also like to point uh, out that there is this book uh, on fluid mechanics by Professor Kundu and Cohen. Uh, there is a, a paperback Indian edition available for now. And if anyone is uh, particularly interested in uh, reading um, materials on waves, this is an excellent book. I would uh, wholeheartedly uh, recommend this. Um, well, warm welcome to all of you. Uh, beginning of the semester, I suppose, is the first class. So, <clears throat> we have assembled here to talk about uh, foundation of scientific computing. Course number is uh, SC371. <clears throat> uh, okay, that's me. Uh, you could look at me here. Um, This is the way to contact me anytime you need to. Uh, those are my couple of email IDs. You can call me on internal numbers on 7945 or 7253. Uh, there are no fixed contact hours. You can just simply call me and drop in. <coughs> Since I will be busy teaching a couple of courses uh, in the morning half, so it would be preferable that you look for me in the afternoon. Uh, don't bother about this URL, but uh, for the next one, you should please make a note of it. This is a course URL we have uh, set up on a server uh, called spectral.iitk.ac.in. We'll load some material from time to time on this for a short while. I don't wish to keep it permanently, maybe for a week or so, and then we'll download it. Okay. As far as the grading and exams are concerned, it's fairly straightforward. Will depend mostly on your midsem and NSEM. That should account for 80% of all your total grade. We'll of course uh, do some projects or that should take care of the two. <coughs> now, of course, um, when we talk about a subject like this, uh, scientific computing, uh, well, nothing could be said more eloquently by what Mark Twain has said that. Uh, fascination with science always yields some dividend and one could uh, come out with a fantastic amount of returns. Uh, let me also tell you, scientific computing is not the type of computing we talk about that you do using a commercial software bought in the marketplace. Uh, to take the analogy to extreme, it is almost like comparing astrology with astrophysics, right? So it's the same thing here. Scientific computing is distinctly different from so-called engineering computing that you do by from those uh, software in the market. So that's why let's uh, probe a little bit more about uh, relationship between computing and science. I just uh, quoted this uh, paper from Nature, appeared a few years ago, talking about what would be the state of art as far as computing is concerned in year 2020. I don't know what, why people get this fascination for 2020. Everybody writes about 2020. I, well, uh, probably it's something to do with short-sightedness. People want to keep that way. <coughs> well, let's uh, look at it, uh, how science is improving. Science is becoming less reductionist. What exactly we mean by that? You know, this is the uh, cause-effect uh, model that we usually talk about, that we have a definitive cause, we see an effect. That's your reductionist approach. However, um, we see all kinds of systems around ourselves which are uh, far too complex. To model those complex systems, we need to have a different approach. That is what we call as an integrative approach or inductive approach. So that means that we are just no more content in visualizing systems by constructing abstract models, simple models, paradigms, concepts. What we instead like to do is bring in the complexity of a real life system and that's what we talk about when we say we are going from reductionist to integrative. So in that uh, particular aspect, this uh, statement is very cogent here that if we look at uh, 
what we are uh, going to do with applied computer science, or uh, we should play the same role that the mathematicians were playing for uh, two, three centuries, uh, basically providing an orderly formal framework that should help us explore newer avenues for understanding science. So, we are just uh, taking it to a next higher level, what uh, theoretical uh, tools cannot deliver, we aim to deliver some of them using computing. <coughs> so, basically then we will go from models to actual dynamical systems and when we are talking about a dynamical systems, most of you are familiar, you have a uh, transfer function that characterizes the dynamical system, you have input and then you get definitive output. The only thing is this dynamical system is not as simple as what you may have done in your basic electrical engineering courses. It is going to be lot more complicated because it, the main dynamical system by itself uh, may consist of many, many subsystems. The input also could be multiple. Think of a very simple example. For example, when we toss a coin, it is such a simple event, right? Even today we cannot model it. Uh, because of multiple inputs and because probably our the model that we uh, try to look at is uh, not rooted to a simple uh, system that we are used to seeing in a mechanical system governed by Newtonian law. So, what happens is basically that is why we resort to statistical tool, right. So, we cannot, uh, we cannot uh, uh, model the system. So, if we cannot do that, we incur some error. When our model itself is faulty, we call such error as the process noise. So, we do not even know enough about the process itself. Then of course, you have the uh, problem of modeling the input and finally, <coughs> even the measurement of output. Measurement noise also plays a major role. So, when we uh, take care of all of that, we actually go to our uh, integral dynamical system approach. Uh, in the context of uh, present day, what we can do is we can fall back upon calculations which have to be uh, very high fidelity calculations um, and we should draw tools from advancement arising in hardware, those arising from software, we could come out with better algorithms to solve the actual problem and all of this should also be supplemented with improvement of our theoretical model itself, right. <coughs> so, in the ideal scenario, a computational scientist should know. Uh, Computational scientists should know the principles or uh, the way the information is handled inside a computer because that is rather important because you are looking for advancement, you should know how this data are put in, how they are handled and moreover, one should also know the scope of limitation of the simulation itself. We have a general tendency to treat this as a black box system. So, we tend to shy away from knowing the nuts and bolts of what constitute those modeling tools. That should not do. If you are going to contribute significantly meaningfully, it is quite likely that you need to really know how this uh, whole black box is working, so that you can yourself contribute to its improvement. So, that means actually uh, to know how to write large codes and how we test them in a modular manner. These are not like your operating system you buy, you know they keep on adding patch over patch and today whatever the operating system you have, <coughs> if you try to put it in, in a computer of 10 years ago, memory will not be sufficient, right? Because that is a very faulty model of developing even the operating system that we are uh, saddled with. <coughs> now, Drawing the analogy again, the computational expert should view themselves as mathematicians, uh, like the way that we uh, see them functioning in different branches of science. At the same time, uh, 
The theoretical scientists also should be conversant uh, with computational techniques because then only they would be able to meaningfully contribute and this synergy will of course take us to greater heights. So we basically need scientists trained uh, in this advanced uh, methodologies and with the challenging problems uh, that uh, we find out in science that should help us focusing and motivating our research in computing. <coughs> you have seen some such benefit already accruing uh, in the field of sensor network, uh, data mining, data integration, grid computing, flood computing. You have a whole host of uh, new branches uh, coming up. <coughs> well, um, these are uh, some of the things you can see where scientific computing can go all the way from atmospheric science which has a very definitive uh, history on its development to ge new subjects like genomics which are probably only 20 years old, 30 years old. And we have said that in real life situation integrative system level approach will be sought and these are already being uh, seen uh, enacted in fields like uh, biology, climate, pre ecology, earthquake prediction. They all essentially depend upon uh, large computing resources which are distributed in nature. We will talk about distributed computing, a brief introduction of it. And uh, this is one prediction that in year 2020, we should be looking at uh, complex ecosystems with uh, millions or even billions of computers which will be called tiny modes or nodes or pods they would be deployed to track the complex systems. However, having said uh, all this um, uh, inspirational talk of what we should be doing, what we are doing currently, currently also leaves us uh, some room to probe further and I am not talking about conspiracy theory. This is uh, what Orwell, Orwell said that within any important issue there are many more other issues which people are reluctant to talk about. So we will be talking about some of those issues and find out what is a better way of computing and uh, we will set the thing. Now, this is a lighter uh, aspect of uh, computing. Uh, we all see from time to time there is a intense competition among diverse groups saying that what they can do with uh, computing and they generally use the word supercomputing. Uh, we never made out what really supercomputing is because these are the kind of diverse activities those have been uh, claimed. For example, people talk about aerodynamics of Pringles and this is taken from a CNN site which talks about Pringle potato chips. Uh, the story is it is not really a potato chips. How many of you know that? It is all uh, synthetic savory. It is all industrial product. If you look closely, look at the content, you will find out that it contains less than 50 percent of potato flour. The rest of it are different types of ingredients. So it is really not a potato chips, but then people are making a big uh, hoo-ha about it on a popular TV program saying that uh, we need to know the aerodynamic features of these chips because they are going in a conveyor belt. We do not want them to fly off. Such a noble goal, huh? Uh, well, on the other extreme, people have been looking at uh, some real esoteric activities like creating a computer playing, uh, uh, sorry, the chess playing computer. Uh, this uh, began way back in 1956. I will give you a little bit of a milestone shortly. And it took 41 years when a computer was really able to defeat a grandmaster. So Gary Kasparov will be remembered among all the grandmaster for this dubious distinction. So this is how it all began in 1946. Uh, first computer was called ENIAC, Electronic Numerical Integrator and Computer. And what was it uh, doing at that time? Of course, war has ended, but the preparation never ceases about fighting war. We always like war, right? 
So people are looking at application in ballistics. Then of course, uh, better wind tunnels to design deadlier aircrafts or maybe even benign peaceful users. Then uh, this is one thing that we always uh, give credit to, this group of people who have been trying to do almost an impossible job, that is weather prediction. So they were trying to do a better weather prediction. Now look at their success rate. To predict 24 hours of weather, they had to run the code for 24 hours. So it's a concurrent information processing, right? So you look at the output and look out of the window and see what is happening. Are you calculating it properly? That's a joke because uh, weather prediction we're talking about is on a global scale. And looking out of the window is a micrometeorology that is done in a different context. I don't think people were that interested in micrometeorology in 1946. They were looking at the global weather prediction. And of course, uh, our uh, favorite is the random number studies. And you may be interested to know that this is to consume quite a bit of power. Uh, almost, uh, well, you can see it's 160 kilowatt, right? Where is it? Well, it's written 174 of 174 kilowatt, and so that used to attract a lot of insects from outside. This was housed in a big room. The footprint of the machine itself is 80 by 3, and those are made from those vacuum tubes, uh, used to generate a lot of heat, and those bugs, insects used to be attracted. They used to come and sit on them. They'll die, and sooner or later, the vacuum tube will give up. And then they will say, we have a bug problem. And even today, when we write a program and we get into some kind of trouble, we say we have a bug. So that's the origin. It all originated there. The, so we, as we say, that we still look at them as a bug, even in the software. But at that time, it was talked about in the context of a hardware, failure of a hardware. Uh, University of Pennsylvania graduate students actually have developed the same functionality on a chip now, which has a size of 40 millimeter square. And you can see the comparison here side by side. And it has uh, power consumption has come down to 0.5 watt now. It, because it does not have those vacuum tubes, it does not have those resistors and capacitors. And of course, the size is uh, really miniaturized. <coughs> so that's how we all began. Then in 1951, Professor Minos Minsky uh, built this uh, computer to mimic uh, networks of neurons in the brain called SNARK. This is a momentous day. Bacchus and his team at IBM uh, started developing the scientific programming language called Fortran. I uh, will talk about Fortran and other language in a little while, but please do understand what uh, Fortran started with, it continues to deliver despite all the fashion statements that we hear from different language from time to time. It is the uh, surviving scientific language tool. <coughs> this was what I told you, 1957, the first chess playing computer Maniac was designed at Los Alamos. And of course, in 1997, we know uh, it finally uh, came to the goal of defeating uh, a grandmaster. So this was the original startup point of chess playing computer and this is where it all shown up its potential. <coughs> we'll talk about uh, this aspect in a short while. Now when we come to uh, the actual usage of uh, this uh, high performance computing that came about, one of the nice uh, milestone was achieved in 1969 when a general circulation model for coupled ocean and uh, atmosphere code was run by Manabe and Brian. And this uh, significantly improved weather prediction. Uh, needless to say that this was helped uh, because at the same time, I suppose uh, our satellite technology was also improving. And uh, as I told you about integrative approach, weather prediction is one such integrative approach. 
because anything and everything that we can get from the atmosphere, we try to put in those information in our weather prediction code and those all uh, came around around the same time. Our computing ability became better. Then we have all this other inputs coming from different technical sources that really significantly improved weather prediction. In a temperate climate like in Europe or in North America above uh, latitude of 30 degree north, the weather prediction has really improved significantly. Uh, now, I suppose uh, people can get very good quality weather prediction for 48 hours upfront. This is with the qualifier that even today also the same set of people will not be able to track a cyclone very clearly. Those are problems of fluid mechanics. If we have time, we'll talk about them. But uh, uh, general day-to-day -day weather prediction with some weather events occurring, those could be done, uh, are done quite uh, routinely now. <coughs> well, 1972 was the time uh, handheld calculator made its appearance and it took only four years uh, before Seymour Cray launched the first supercomputer. Now, I will give you a formal definition of supercomputer. You would be very uh, interested to know that what that supercomputer delivered in 1976. I think uh, all this uh, laptop will beat that supercomputer hollow in terms of computing power. So, supercomputer is a euphemism. It is a fashion statement dependent on the time frame we are looking at. So, we have now more computing power at our desk than this supercomputer delivered. In fact, Cray 2 was delivered in 1986 and it uh, gave us a computing power which is uh, referred to by a first gigaflop machine. All your uh, laptop and uh, desktop PCs uh, today give more than a gigaflop. So, you can see that uh, that much of computing power you have. Well, it depends on us how we use them. So, are we using them as a supercomputer or a chat network? That depends on us. <coughs> now, one of the major uh, aspects of supercomputing in science depends on how we solve the problem. And uh, one of the algorithmic uh, development came about uh, with the advent of parallel processing. So, you are basically solving a chunk of integral problem in parallel by slicing it into bits and your computer is going to work on them bit by bit and integrate the result, then you go to the next step and so on and so forth. So, that is the parallel machine that was uh, the concept of parallel processing came about with the advent of connection machine machine. The CM machines came and that also revolutionized uh, uh, scientific computing. <coughs> Of course, uh, this is what we all depend on now. The World Wide Web was uh, developed by this physicist, uh, Berners-Lee. He thought uh, he could uh, synchronize the computing power at different part of the world and solve those big, big problems of physics. And we know how World Wide Web is used today. Uh, people are still not solving those physics problems for which it was actually thought would be used. <coughs> oh, the next uh, milestone came about in 1997, where again we see a thousand fold increase in computing power from gigaflop to a teraflop machine achieved by ASCII red machine. And to cut the sh story short, when we look at 2008, this is the fastest uh, supercomputer available once again at Los Alamos. Uh, when it was introduced in 2008, it had 1.026 petaflops. How do we uh, benchmark these speeds? They are basically now taking a set of linear algebraic equations uh, available in this uh, package called LINPAC. And 
in this activity they actually were solving 2 million coupled equations simultaneously. That is a moderate uh, number, not a big deal. I mean, we, we, we ought to be ready to do that any point in time in solving big problems. Uh, what was more interesting about this road runner was that it is one of the most energy efficient computer for each watt spent it delivers 488 megaflop power. You probably know this existence of this list called top 500. You can go to the web and you can find out every year. I think in the month of June and November they update the list. So the list that I am showing you uh, is up to date. I think it has crossed 1.05 now. So it is a marginal improvement over the last 6 months. It is probably because of addition of more processes, uh, but we are still uh, hovering around 1 petaflop uh, rating. <coughs> ah, this is the number 2. This is really fancy, is not it? This is uh, a Cray computer, Jaguar. This is uh, at the Oak Ridge. This also comes close uh, second. Uh, let me tell you that uh, all the top 500 machines that we uh, see uh, deliver quite a bit of process for power and these are the top 5 that you can see. This is the road runner, this is the Jaguar, this is the new kid in the block. It just made its announcement last month, uh, German uh, group, but you can see the number of processors they are using. Of course, we do not call them any more processors, what we call them as? codes because each processor can uh, have CPUs with multiple cores like most of you probably would be using a core to do or dual core or quad core machines. Uh, this one actually the nine core machine, nine core processors. Have you been interested to know that this was actually developed for PlayStation by Sony? These are uh, graphics processors. So, graphics processors have a enhanced ability for number crunching. So, they are very fast. So, in case any of you fancy to put up a, a fast computer together, the basic unit should actually be drawn from uh, this graphics processor. You can actually see different machines use this different core. Uh, this has uh, come about uh, to about, well, crossed a petaflop barely, but using about almost 300,000 processes. These are the top 5 that you uh, see in that top 500 list. Let me also tell you that uh, do not pay too much of attention on this kind of listings, because there are lots of people, lots of organizations who do not want to divulge what they are doing. especially the defense research in USA will never compete for this. So, that is why uh, do not pay too much of uh, faith in this uh, list. Although in India we are used to newspaper headlines that we are number 5 or number 18 now, uh, those are uh, not so good, but there are certain good aspects even for those activities. I am not belittling them, they are good, but uh, let us uh, keep that aside. Uh, so, that is what now you would have that we want to solve a real time problem with a faster machine, more powerful machines. So, it connotes a powerful and expensive system. So, all these machines <laughs> cost more than 100 million dollars. And uh, <clears throat> of course, they are used for weather prediction. Uh, we use it quite often, aerospace engineers, even for designing uh, new cars for looking at its crash worthiness or safety aspects, uh, such activities are taken and of course, any problem on physics and maths which require large scale computing would use the best in the market. <coughs> uh, so, apart from those uh, benchmark numbers, let us see what really uh, distinguishes this high performance computing machines from the other uh, uh, machines used for non high performance computing. Uh, it all began uh, with uh, the idea of Seymour Cray, 
where he actually conceived of uh, having a vector computer. So, if you have an unknown array, you break it down into few vectors and process them as ve vectors and that is how uh, this uh, all began in that 1976 machine. Of right now, we can uh, go to not necessarily a vector, we have uh, machines which uses very, very large number of interconnected processors and these processors need not necessarily be homogeneous, means they sh need not belong to the same class or category, they could be heterogeneous. So, you could have a room filled with different types of PC and you can put them together uh, in a cluster and you can derive enhanced power which all originated uh, in uh, vector processing and the current uh, activity is what we call as parallel computing. Okay. <coughs> So, with this, uh, definition of uh, high performance computing, we can also see that uh, there are other ways which we uh, talk about. You may have heard of quantum computers, but let me warn you, quantum computers and the traditional computers that we talk about, they are apples and oranges. They do not perform the same task. They are not even fruits. So, even apples and oranges is being charitable to quantum computing. Uh, they actually solve entirely different class of problems. Uh, what you do in with the classical computers, I do not think any quantum computer will be able to do it right now. Then uh, you may have heard of grid computing. That is probably what uh, World Wide Web was conceived of. So, now that is being uh, exploited grid computers, then we know supercomputers, we have the mainframes, we have the minis, micros, then of course we have the front end, the terminals, and we may have embedded computers that should come in most probably in near future in all white goods, domestic purpose usage. Your fridge, your TV, everything should probably come fitted with computers. Okay. <coughs> so we have all possibilities looking at us. Now, we have talked about it. You know, the main thing to realize that computing performance has grown by about 2 million times in the last 30 years. And this last 30 years means I am talking about 1975 to 2005. Today, we have uh, petascale computing and we hope to arrive at a time when we uh, would be doing great things, greater things. This is a sort of a comparison between USA and Japan. Uh, the red dots are the Japanese ones, the yellows are the USA machines and we are right now here. This is one petaflop, so we are already here. So, this open circles are the ones those are projected, but already we have reached here uh, in 2008, we have crossed one petaflop rating. The Japan plans to get to 10 petaflop machines. So, this is a 10 petaflop machine. They are hoping to get it by uh, 2011 or 2012. And as you can see that uh, we started from here with the first supercomputer Cray 1 and then we reached in uh, 1980 uh, the first gigaflop machine and then this was the teraflop and then this is the petaflop. So, the march is on and perils of projection, you know. You ask uh, anyone and everyone, they will tell you that you give me this, I will deliver you this. And this is what was uh, predicted by a uh, scientist from NASA Ames, uh, Dean Chapman. Uh, he wrote this paper, Computational Aerodynamics, Development and Outlook in 1979 and I just want to draw your attention uh, that he said that when we uh, get this kind of number of points. So, this is a million point, this is 10 million point, 100 million points. So, they said that when we reach about around 1 million points, we should be solving the flow past a complete aircraft. 
Now, of course, in your PC, you can do it, right? You have uh, more memory than that. How many people are uh, computing flow paths to full aircraft? Not many I know of. Of course, the uh, companies, the aircraft companies are doing it, uh, but that does not come with this kind of projection. They work on a different issues. Well, it's probably we human beings are optimists, so we always uh, look at the positive approach of what we can get. <coughs> this you probably all know. Anything that you cannot prove, you can proclaim it as a law. So Moore did that. And he said that every 18 months, the number of processors in a chip doubles. This excludes all the supercomputers and all. Supercomputers actually outstrips Moore's law. So there is already a, always an exception to Moore's law. I don't know why computer scientist people call this as Moore's law. Uh, this computer power and the memory actually are growing exponentially with time. And this memory that we are talking about, this is the RAM not the hard disk path. Those grow actually even much faster rate, double exponential rate. And we have already said that computing power is uh, denoted by floating point operations per second. So that means that if you have a higher plops machine, you have higher computing power. And then uh, we can keep on trying to speed up the performance gain of the computers. and but we must be uh, alert uh, to the constraints that uh, more and more number of processors are packed in a chip. We are actually creating more heat and that is a significant constraint. For example, um, by 2010, people project that uh, there would be 1 billion transistors in a chip and that would create about 2 kilowatts of thermal energy. And if you look at the energy density per unit area, this heat creation is more than what actually a nuclear reactor does on a per unit area basis. So it's a uh, fascinating figure to keep back of your mind that this is a serious problem. <coughs> For example, look at this ASCII Q computer which was uh, housed in Los Alamos in 2002. Uh, it delivered about 30 teraflop. It had about 12,000 processors uh, in 2048 nodes, had 12 terabytes of RAM and 600 terabytes of disk storage. This was the building that was housing this, 300,000 square feet and it had to have those cooling towers, rows of them and those cooling towers would reject heat into the atmosphere. And if the computer needed 3 megawatts of power, the cooling needed 2 megawatts of power. So it's such a serious problem that you encounter. So what happened at the time of introduction was that every time a computer is started on, it would run for a few hours, then it had to be rebooted. And we have this nice thing called mean time between failures, MTBF. So at that time, this <laughs> MTBF was only few hours for ASCII queue. Of course, in comparison, today the blue gene of IBM that was installed in Lawrence Livermore, uh, the power significantly came down to 2.33 megawatts and it, it had a much higher power rating, you can see. As compared to 30 teraflop, this is 480 <coughs> teraflop. And this is the fastest machine that we already have uh, talked about. <coughs> okay, this is uh, on the left is your ASCII queue and this is your roadrunner of today. Uh, you can get a pretty good uh, idea of what supercomputers look like. <coughs> so where do we go from here? Okay, the milestone set for supercomputer is to emulate uh, the performance of a human brain. Why? Because it is still little into the future, we can continue to give excuses for some more time for not being there. Uh, what a uh, human brain does, it performs about 10 to the power 16 synaptic events. That is equivalent to something like 10 petaflop. And human brain has only 10 terabytes of memory. 
So it is worth what? 60,000 rupees now? Can you get a brain for 60,000 rupees? Oh, I do not know. Ah, the main interesting part is this. It only consumes 10 watts of power. Only 10 watts of power. Now, you know your computer requires at least 100 watts to deliver 1 gigaflop. So, if you can scale up to this, you would require billion watts of power. But the interesting part is not about uh, the speed of computing, I think it is the quality of computing that is distinctly different in human brain as compared to a computer. For example, we are predicting that by 2019, we should get a exaflop machine that is your 10 to the power 3 petaflop machine. So, next milestone and of course, I do not know how this uh, etymology comes about, but every time you increase it thousand fold and you have a fancy acronym here, zeta flop, yolta flop, zeta flop. So, it will keep coming. I think some of you can uh, keep on thinking about putting some more numbers to the right. Ah, there it is. So, if you look at uh, a road runner versus human brain, I told you that qualitatively human brain uh, functions in a different way. <coughs> Synaptic uh, operations in brain are actually done through ion channels and these are basically chemical signals. It is not electrical signal per se. You got to realize that electron travels much, much faster than this uh, uh, liquid in the uh, ion channel under the same electric field. The bottom line is computers are faster, but they are tremendously wasteful. Uh, they are much more faster. That is why they could defeat a grandmaster because uh, blue gene L came to that uh, stage where it could do much faster calculation, faster than a grandmaster could think of. Uh, we know that uh, it defeated a grandmaster. <coughs> now, present day processors are manufactured on 45 nanometer uh, scale. I think it has uh, come down to something like 32 or something in recent document I have seen. But uh, we are getting there virtually hitting the wall. <coughs> this uh, hitting the wall will come about because of the heating issues plus this is a, a dangerous thing lurking in the corner, indeterminacy of on off positions of switches and this is what is called as quantum mechanics effect. So, we would not even know whether a switch is in a on state or off state. So, it has been claimed that quantum computing will take care of this. Uh, I have put a question mark because I do not believe uh, it is as trivial as that. This paper in nature once again uh, uh, state that uh, quantum computer should be available by 2020 because there are many, many technical uh, challenges those have to be circumvented. Now, uh, one of the reason the heat is generated is we have too many interconnect wires and this ohmic heating creates this heat. Suppose we replace them by optoelectronic uh, connectors, then we can probably Im improvise and <coughs> deliver more computing power. Okay. <coughs> so, maybe future supercomputers would use laser lights for uh, communicating uh, data streams. <coughs> People have already started working on uh, materials like indium phosphide and RBM. They are etched on the top of uh, silicon chip. Uh, some references uh, are given here. You can uh, take a look at uh, this if you are interested. I am not an expert. I do not know what uh, is in store really. <coughs> well, uh, software and algorithm played its role, I told you, starting with vector processing, we came to parallel processing. Um, we also uh, uh, have to think of uh, sometimes uh, a new innovative architecture. This was uh, uh, adopted by uh, Dr. Narendra Karmarkar at CRL Pune 
uh, that delivered us that ECA computer, which is the fastest Indian computer in the top 500 list. Today also it is in 18th spot, uh, where he actually uh, conceived of innovative cluster architecture and uh, sourced all the hardware from the market and came out with this kind of computing power. <coughs> well, parallel and cluster computing essentially involves uh, breaking a work or a task into smaller pieces and you do some kind of what is called as a domain decomposition uh, used by a technique developed by a mathematician by name Schwartz. So, we call it Schwartzian domain decomposition. Uh, that is the backbone of all parallel computing. And what we do is we take uh, the domain and break it into subdomains and problem is solved independently in each processes. After that activity, individual processors uh, communicate. So, this is uh, the basically the thing. We have the main problem, we split it into four independently, we have work here at this level. After the step is done, we again go back and integrate the data for the whole domain together and from there again we restart. So, it is basically uh, you can realize that there is lot of uh, I O involved. There is lot of input uh, output transactions involved. So, what happens is uh, architecture also is built around in two ways if you have a shared memory or you have a distributed memory, I am sure you all of you know of it. So, it is not really worth uh, explaining to you what they are, but they do use some kind of special uh, purpose uh, software libraries uh, like PVM, parallel virtual machine, MPIs and uh, they are uh, uh, without them it is very, very difficult to uh, work on. In fact, even I do not uh, do myself parallel computing, I depend on my brains here. <coughs> okay, performance issues uh, we can see uh, is a communication is a major issue for distributed computing. Uh, if we have a poor design, we will have congestion of data and the performance deteriorates. Uh, what we do usually we have uh, something called a master, under the master we have some slaves. So, this is what happens, suppose a slave is not doing its part then of course, the information uh, is not sent back to the master after one step and if all the information is not there, you cannot go to the next step. So, that is what is a problem of latency we call. So, that latency is a major <laughs> issue that we need to worry about. Uh, so, we need to understand what is called as load balancing. We should give, uh, distribute the load equally, equitably among all the sub processes. So, that they all conclude at the same time, send back the information to the master, so that we are ready to go for the next step. So, you also understand that uh, between uh, shared memory and distributed memory, shared memory will be preferred, because then from the same memory, uh, all the sub processes are tapping their information and putting them back. So, you do not have to do that much of I O transactions as you do with a distributed memory. Okay. So, this is uh, uh, about massively parallel computers. Uh, what happens is, um, although we said that in parallel processing we will uh, break up the problem into smaller sub pieces, uh, but then those pieces are not completely distinct from each other. There would be some kind of overlap, because we have to communicate among the processes. So, this is uh, what we call as overlapping subdomains. And if we have a massive parallel computing going on, this overlapping uh, subdomains actually uh, creates some kind of problems in communication latencies, because what one uh, processor is doing, the conclusion of its task, it is supposed to transmit those informations near that overlapped region to its neighbors. So, if that is not done efficiently, that would also create a latency problem. <coughs> so, the current trend is of course, go for cluster of workstations uh, and then we have come to this level, where we have multi-core machines, which we are seeing more and more uh, and then uh, people are again relooking at uh, 
shared memory systems on. As far as uh, algorithm issues are concerned, this somewhat depends on machine architecture, parallel algorithm development and efficient parallelizing uh, are a subject uh, of many such researchers. Uh, I have given you a one reference here and you can look at uh, there are some problems which are called Nick Pippinger's class of problems which are efficiently parallelized. Uh, it, uh, but this uh, information may be dated. Uh, I'm not very sure about that. <coughs> there are other ways where uh, we could uh, contribute. We could develop uh, better methods of calculation itself. And we have uh, done a bit by ourselves. Uh, this uh, or by some new implicit methods and we get an order of magnitude improvement uh, and in fact that gives us a computing power improvement uh, of the order of uh, maybe 100 times to 1000 times. So we end up uh, doing lots of problems on our desktop which probably uh, people elsewhere use a uh, supercomputer to solve them. <coughs> okay. <coughs> now, as far as programming guidelines are concerned, I told you Fortran came in 1954, then we had all kinds of languages coming up, Algol, PL1, C, C++, Java. But Fortran is the longest surviving and very adaptable uh, language. This adaptability actually is the key to its uh, longevity because it kind of incorporates all the better features or features of all other languages. And uh, it is uh, seen that Fortran actually outperforms uh, C version of codes. Because what happens in Fortran compiler, you actually can identify the kernel which is doing the main computing and that could be hand optimized which is not possible. And I will show you an example here. This is uh, from a paper. The uh, simple multiplication is done, matrix multiplication. On this side, you have the number of uh, elements uh, of those uh, matrix size and on this side is the speed. So, left hand side you are seeing Fortran, this is the C. You can see this scale is different, this is 600, this is 300. So, there is a factor difference and what you also notice that depending on the architecture, every machine has a fair bit of plateau where it performs well, but then it has a performance degradation if the size of the uh, problem becomes bigger than this. In this case, you can see a drastic fall. And uh, these are four different machines. You can see in all of them, you can uh, notice that Fortran always <coughs> outperforms. Unfortunately, I think uh, uh, it is not being uh, taught here. Uh, but uh, all the students pick them up. It's very easy. Uh, so when it comes to scientific computing, I'm sure uh, any of you taking up any uh, new problem, you would be well advised to look at uh, Fortran more seriously because if you continue to work in scientific computing, that is the language of preference. Um, so, I think um, this is a kind of a general introduction I wanted to give it to you in this class. From the next class, we will get into the subject proper. We will talk about various aspects of uh, scientific computing and as I told you uh, that uh, I have a core of students, uh, some of them are here. They are basically uh, uh, working on various aspects of our computing activities. So, any time I give you some assignments, etcetera, you are most welcome to visit our lab that is in the aerospace building. And you can discuss about your problem and there are your other classmates. I can see quite a few of them. They are already use our lab, so you can also uh, come and join them. So, this is where I stop. <laughs>